let's take a look at this feature snapshot, right? And this is the agenda. Oh goodness. So this is the agenda of today's talk. Um, first we will talk about why are we building the snapshot for uh, Ozone. And if you look at other object stores out there, they support something similar, it's called object versioning. And we will talk about why that feature is not enough. Uh, and we will also look at different use cases that snapshots enable. Uh, and once we know why we are building it, we are clear about that, we will talk about uh, Okay, we have this feature available. How, what can I do with it? How can I use it? And after all that, we will we will go a little bit uh, details into how we are designing it for Ozone and how does it work. Uh, a little bit of you know more into internal designs. So let's talk about first object versioning, right? A lot of object stores out there they they have this feature individual object versioning. And they have been calling it a snapshot. So let's look at what is the difference. Right? So in object versioning, in your bucket, you create a bunch of these different objects, right? And if you look at individual objects, every time they get mutated, you create a new version of these objects and you, you leave the existing version out there, right? You, you don't delete it. And over time, you can see all this bunch of objects. They will go through like multiple versions. And you have a namespace explosion here, right? Uh, and somebody has to worry about cleaning up all these different versions uh, of the object uh, lying out there. As opposed to that, if you look at a uh, snapshot feature, uh, we, are, we are not looking at individual object. We are looking at a group of objects that are managed by one application as a cohesive unit. And what happens is this group, uh, this bunch of objects as a group, as an atomic unit, all of them move together from one version to another version. So that's the key difference. Now let's look at what is problem with versioning. Does it really solve the problem for application developers, or is it really creating you know another another set of problems for them? So as we talked about it, the, the very first problem is accumulating too many versions over time, and you have a namespace explosion, right? And these object stores out there, they provide you something like lifecycle management of individual objects. So you can expire these objects over time, uh, depending on like uh, how long they have been out there. But there is a problem with that also. So what is the problem? So if you look at from applications perspective, right, not an object store developers perspective, you will, uh, you will have like all these different objects, they will be correlated. So here I have an example, you have object B, which was created about a year back. You create another object A, which refers to this object. And over time you create different versions of it. Now what can happen is now object B, some of its older versions, right, they can expire and the object store can automatically delete them. And then what you will be, you will be left with is a dangling reference, right? Object, a version of object A points to something that doesn't exist. So this can be, this is an example of just two objects, right? But think about an application's perspective that is like managing thousands or like tens of thousands of objects. They are linking to each other. You have, um, you know, over time you are creating a big problem. So let's look at like how does it, you know, how does it look like? So you have a, uh, Object one here, different versions. Object two again, bunch of versions. Anytime the application is creating a de dependency, you have this reference explosion. Different versions pointing to another set of objects, different version. And it's very hard for application to determine like which versions correspond to which versions of another object and which one of them really makes sense from application's cons consistency perspective. And at this point, if I create more references, it's really going to be a nightmare. As opposed to that, if I look at uh, object store snapshot feature that we developed for Ozone. So application can define dependency between like different objects here. 
And once that is defined, all of them together with their references, they will atomically move from one version to another version and so on and so forth. You don't have any problem with application consistency. So let's look at a uh, you know, more realistic example here. I have a financial application, right? A very simple application, all I want to do is I want to transfer a $50 from one account to another account. I'm representing account for all these different people as individual objects. So I have account A repre represented by an object here, account B repre uh, represented by another object here. And I carry out this transaction. Of course, like different steps of this transaction will go one by one. So first I'm subtracting $50 from this account and then adding it to another account. So if you look at an intermediate state, right? Uh, in this app consistent state, if you sum the total amount of money that is at the bank at that point of time, 50 and 200, it is $50 less, right? So there are so many combinations. The B4 of an object, it doesn't make sense with the B7 of object B or the B5 of an object A doesn't make sense with uh, B7 of another object. As opposed to this, with the snapshot feature, what I can do is when the application, my financial application is in this state, I take a snapshot. And finally, when the transaction completes, I can take another snapshot. So now we know like what, what are the problems that are there with versioning and how the snapshot kind of feature helps with this. Let's look at like what are the different use cases it can think about. So one of the primary use cases that we are looking at is data protection. Right? What I can do is I have the active object store. Uh, in consistent state, I take a snapshot. I can let modifications go on the active object store. And this is snapshot, I can preserve it somewhere in my, you know, uh, back in the storage. And then if there is any problem with this uh, application, if it crashes, let's say there is a malware or ransomware infection and there is a corruption, I can always go back to my snapshot and restore the application state from there. If I restart the application, I'm not going to get into any weird state because I have a consistent image. So let's look at another use case compliance. Like there are different government regulations here in US, in EU, which mandate that you have to keep your copy of data for a certain amount of time. And what I can do with a snapshot is, again, I take an app consistent image. I let the modification continue on active object store, but I have a stable image in this snapshot X. And I can have a separate archival tier and I can move my snapshot to this archival, archival tier here, right? And as required, I can, I can restore from uh, archive, uh, my archival tier. Uh, but primary use cases, uh, for in, in this case, compliance is not so much restore. It's more about keeping the data around for satisfying some compliance regulation. So one of the use case that is getting popular uh, nowadays is time travel, right? I want to go to my application's state as of certain time. Snapshots, it enable that as well. Again, I take app consistent image at time T1. Let the active object store move on. And in my snapshot repository, I can keep all these snapshots that I have taken at different times. Again, app consistent images. And if I want to do a time travel, I can just restore my application to any specific time that I have taken explicit snapshot in. Another primary use case for a snapshot is disaster recovery, right? So for DR use cases, we want to keep our copies of data on another remote site. So we have a replication engine here. What it would do is it takes a snapshot of your active object store over here. And once you have this stable image of this snapshot at time T1, you can let the changes continue on your active object store. You take this stable image and you replicate it. Now, why can't I do it uh, without this snapshot? Because, you know, as you are replicating your data underneath 
uh, you are, uh, you know, as you are moving the changes, it can change. For example, you did, did a listing of operation and as you are trying to replicate some file, suddenly it disappears from uh, under you. So those problems would not be there with, uh, with a snapshot when you are doing full replication. But that's not enough. With a snapshots, you can do a lot more. So this image is constantly changing and you want to keep your remote site in sync with your primary site, right? So for that, we do something called Delta replication. So what you do is, over time, as the object store changes, you take another snapshot T2. Now what I can do is, I can again do a full replication for this snapshot T2. But when you are looking at like 10 petabyte plus object store size, you don't want to do full replication all the time. It's going to be time consuming and you will not be able to meet your SLS. So we, we will provide a primitive called SnapDiff. So given two snapshots, it can very efficiently compute exactly what has changed between them. So the 10 petabyte example data set that we talked about. So let's say over the next one hour or couple of hours, only 100 gig of your data changed. So you don't have to replicate the entire 10 petabyte all over again. You can use this API, very efficiently compute that, oh, the, the change that has happened is only 100 gig. So you can replicate only that 100 gig part and apply it on the remote side. And then you arrive at this, this other image, snapshot T2 on the remote side as well. So using this feature, you can pretty much keep your remote copy in sync with your primary copy. And the way we have implemented uh, this snapshot feature, uh, the amount of time it, it takes to create a new snapshot, it's pretty much instantaneous. The amount of time it takes to compute a snap diff, it is only proportionate to the amount of change between the two snapshots. It does not depend on the size of your underlying object store. So now we have looked at different use cases. Now let's look at how, how can I use it. So in Ozone, we support bucket level snapshots. So what I mean by that is, our Ozone namespace, we have a root. Within the root, you can create different volumes. It's different from the AWS S3 where you, under root, you can directly create buckets. We have one level of indirection called volume. You can think of volume as different namespaces for your bucket. So for example, if you are a service provider and if you are hosting multiple companies, you can, you can say that you want to club all the buckets that belong to Coke under one umbrella, that is one volume, and all the buckets that, all the buckets that belong to, let's say, Pepsi, they will be clubbed again uh, under another volume. So within volume, we have the abstraction of bucket. And the snapshot feature that we are providing, it, it, it operates at bucket level. So I can take a snapshot of a bucket. We could, we could support this feature at volume level and at the entire object store level also. But with the Apache release 1.4.0, we are currently supporting only at bucket level. Now, how do I access it? So our active object store namespace, you just reference all these different objects with their full path. So in this case, you have uh, some bucket under volume V2 called bn. So you will access the keys as slash v2 slash bn slash k4. Now how do I access different snapshots? So we have a hidden namespace called dot snapshot. When you take a snapshot on a bucket, uh, we make all of it available in an alternate namespace and you can access it with this uh, expanded path slash vn slash bn dot snapshot. You are going in the hidden namespace. And then you go to snap one and within snap one, you continue with the rest of the key part. And so on and so forth. So let's talk about a snapshot space efficiency, how much amount of space they consume. So the way we have designed, designed it, snapshots, they only consume the incremental amount of space. So what I mean by that is, this is your timeline, your initial state of the system. Let's say it has a bucket in the active object store, uh, it's using about 100 gig of logical data. So your actual physical space will also be 100 gig. Now you move to another state, you took one snapshot of the system. So if you look at the snapshot namespace, you have again 100 gig of logical data available. 
your active object store also has 100 gig, gig of uh, uh, logical usage but if you look at the physical space it is still consuming only 100 gig of data because the snapshot that you created will share the space with your active object store now how does it progress so let's say if you deleted 10 gig of data from the active object store so if you look at the logical space, you are using total 190 gig of logical space. But uh, if you look at the physical space, it will still be 100 gig. Why? Because the, the 100 gig of data is logged in a snapshot one. You cannot do anything with that. So even though you reduce 10 gig of data from your, from your active object store, uh, you can't do anything about this 100 gig. So your actual physical space is logged at 100 gig. What happens if you add another 20 gig of data in your active object store at this point? So you are looking at the actual physical space that is used at 120 gig. Why? Because the 100 gig of data is locked in a snapshot and on top of that, you just added another 20 gig, right? So a snapshot overall, they will use only as much amount of space that is incremental. So let's look at some other primitives that we provide for a snapshot. That's a snapshot creation. So it's an instantaneous operation. So regardless of your underlying data set size, you can have a hundred petabyte of data set. But when you issue a snapshot create, it's pretty much instantaneous operation. Uh, for a smaller data set size, it's sub-second operation. For a very big data, size, uh, data set, uh, 10 petabyte plus, you are looking at single digit seconds. And internally what Ozone does is, it, it maintains all these different snapshots in their time order. So we maintain a chain of snapshots at individual bucket level, as well as at global level. So here, if I create a snapshot a snap1 on a bucket B1, B1, I have a local chain at uh, bucket level B1, B1, and I also maintain a global chain overall system wide another bucket b2 you create a snapshot i have a local chain just for b2 plus the global chain and so on so how do i use these chains that i am creating it's very useful when i when i delete a snapshot i can do a very efficient uh, space reclamation we will come to that in the subsequent slides so the same thing with a snapshot deletion uh, it's an instantaneous operation, but the actual reclamation, it can keep happening in the background. Uh, we will use a snapshot chain to do that. And the way we have implemented this thing for Ozone is, the uh, when you are deleting a snapshot, you don't have to delete a snapshot at the very beginning of the chain or the end of the chain. We support out of order deletion. You can just delete any random snapshot anywhere. Uh, so in this example, I'm deleting snap three. And when I'm deleting it, when I'm doing the space reclamation, I, I don't have to look at all the snapshots in the chain. I just need to look at the immediate previous and the immediate next snapshot. So we will com come to that as well when I talk about the detailed algorithm. So another primitive that we provide is a snapshot dev. So given any two snapshots on the same bucket, we can compute the differences very efficiently. Like we talked about, the time is proportionate only to the amount of churn in the active object store that happened between these two snapshots. And if you are looking at two snapshots which are like far apart in time, like maybe a couple of weeks or so, you can you could have accumulated a, a lot of change, right? And it could be it could take several seconds to compute all of that. So we provided it as an asynchronous API so that your client uh, requests they don't time out. Again, the amount of data that changed, if you return, it could be like millions of keys also. So we uh, return that to you in a paginated response. And what it returns is it will give you a precise list of the keys that were deleted, the keys that we were you know, uh, added the keys that got modified, the keys that got renamed. So you can really build really fancy applications on top of these primitives. We talked about the Delta replication, uh, but that's not it. You can 
create your incremental analytics. So if you are, think about an application that you are developing in the cloud on AWS kind of system, right? And your entire data set is about, let's say, 20 petabyte or 30 petabyte. And every time if you have to compute analytics on this whole 20, 30 petabyte data set, first of all, it will take a lot of time. And then the bill that you will pay to Amazon, right? Uh, as opposed to that, if you are using, uh, you know, the primitives that we are providing you here, uh, you can just compute the incremental. Uh, you, can, you can do your incremental analytics only on the part that changed. Now let's get into the details of how does it all work and a little bit of uh, design uh, of how we implemented it for Ozone. So let's look at the entire Ozone architecture refresher. So I have an Ozone cluster. In the Ozone cluster, uh, we have uh, a, a different layers for namespace management. So for namespace management, we have a component called Ozone Manager. So it uh, it's three-way replicated and it runs a raft ring to keep all the three different ozone managers completely in sync with each other. It's a very strongly consistent uh, namespace manager. Then block space is managed by another com component called storage container manager. This is also like your cluster monitor. And then finally you have all these different data nodes which contain your data blocks. right? So, uh, as opposed to HDFS, our namespace management and block space management, I wanted to highlight that they are completely different and that uh, that was one of the reasons why HDFS could not scale beyond, you know, 300, uh, 200, 300 million objects and cannot work well with the small files, a uh, lot of files, but that is not a problem in Ozone. So, this is what the Ozone architecture looks like. Uh, now let's take a closer look. So what does your namespace look like? So all the different keys that you will create, they will, uh, they are block map. They will be, that will be stored in your ozone manager here. So for a given key, it, it will have a you know, map of all the different locations. So let's look at the location part. It's divided into two parts. Uh, the first part is the container ID. The second part is the block ID within that container. So, if I want to locate where can I find that container, I can get that information from storage container manager, which is managing all the containers cluster wide. It's going to tell me that the, this container, you can find it on data node, data node 1, data node 5 and data node 6. So I go to those data nodes and then this local part, this block ID within the container that is local to the data node. and uh, I can find out those blocks on the on that data. So if you look at the container part of it, our containers, they can stay in two states. The containers could be either open or closed. If it's a closed container, it's completely immutable. You cannot even add anything to it. While a container is in open state, you can only add blocks to it, but we never remove blocks from it. Once a block is written in Ozone, it's pretty much immutable. So we are going to make use of all of this information when we are uh, building this snapshot feature. So let's take a look at it. How are we doing Ozone snapshot? So if I look at the data node part of it, in very large cluster, you can have like hundreds of nodes. Your data blocks are like flying everywhere. But what you are storing in these data nodes, it's immutable. You never change a data block. So when I'm taking a snapshot, I don't really need to take a snapshot of what resides in the data node. If I look at my storage container part, it maintains the cluster state, but this state can be rebuilt. The storage container manager builds all these all this different, you know, uh, mappings from the container report that it gets from different data nodes. So when I'm creating a snapshot, I don't need to take a snapshot of whatever information and keeping in the storage container manager. So that comes down to, if I can take a snapshot of my namespace state, that is good enough for me. What is it? Well, not really. I also need to make sure that 
whenever somebody something some data blocks are uh, deleted some keys are deleted then i'm not going to reclaim those keys the space associated with those keys from the individual data nodes as uh, if those data blocks are referenced by any of the snapshot so as long as i take care of these two things i can build my snapshot so now that we have zeroed on the fact that i have to take taking the snapshot of my ozone manager is enough let's take a look at it in detail so when the client sends any modification uh, request it typically sends to the raft leader node in ozone manager and all of these operations they go to raft log and after some time we drain these operations to the underlying lsm database in our case it's rocks db uh, so i wanted to highlight the part that uh, this works for rocks db but it would work for any lsm database as well and why is that let's take a look at that so all these different operations or modifications that are happening uh, in uh, ozone manager in they all appear like different transactions in your raft log and here you can club them in different groups so in this example i have transaction 1 to transaction 3 which are like modification transactions then transaction 4 is the snapshot create uh, transaction okay so whenever i see the snapshot creation transaction that becomes like a sync barrier for me and then i have subsequent transaction so the first part right the regular transaction i'm going to commit it i'm i'm going to replay those transactions on the underlying rocks db now rocks db keeps all of its data and metadata in this uh, uh, you know any particular rocks db directory and internally it represents all of this into sst files now sst files they are immutable in nature once they are written to anything is written to sst file it's never going to get modified any new changes that are coming in they will give they will go to a new new sst file uh, typically that's the property of any lsm database and that is what we are leveraging here right so when i see a, a snapshot create transaction what i will do is i will create a separate directory that will keep all of that snapshot data and then i'm going to copy that state but hold on if i have to copy all that state it's going to take a lot of time so what i do is i just create hardly and that is why our snapshot create operation it's instantaneous because these files are just pointing to their original uh, location with a higher reference count so if anything gets deleted in your active object store rocks db directory that's not a problem because your reference count on all of these sst file is like two in this case it will go down by one because the snapshot is still referencing it so those files will not be deleted. and any subsequent transaction that is happening after a snapshot create it will only happen in your active rocks db directory so in this case new changes they will they will go to new sst file o.sst so this is what we are using these are the like main ideas about how this feature is working and again it's uh, right because it's status driven remember the ozone manager it uh, runs three different replicas all the three replicas will completely in sync all the three om nodes will have the same notion of when the snapshot was created some internal details uh, earlier we used to have this component ozone metadata manager uh, now we have uh, two separate metadata managers one for the active object store one for the snapshot and again highlighting active object store is going to its own rocks db directory and in the same way all the different snapshots that we will create they will go to their individual directories and this is why if you are infected by any malware or anything right at the most it can uh, you know infect your active object store but whatever we do in snapshot uh, for the snapshot it goes in its only uh, its own read only directory it cannot be modified it's inherent inherently read only and uh, we talked about this part now the key deletion service that we used to have that also we have to make sure uh, it's not going to delete anything that is not referenced by the active object is of object store name space or snapshot name space i want to touch a little bit on the space reclamation part so without snapshot how it used to work is so uh, 
let's look at what we are maintaining our metadata all the different objects that you create they are maintained in key table uh, we have a bunch of other tables also the, but the primarily the key table is the one that maintains the map of a given object key and what are the different location i can find its data block so let's say i deleted key 5 so what would happen is this key 5 will disappear from key table and it will uh, appear in a deleted table it will go away from the namespace but the actual reclamation for this key 5 will happen uh, through key deletion service and uh, it, it will process entries one by one and remove eventually when the space is reclaimed it will remove it from deleted table the way it goes is uh, for the deleted key it finds out what are the data blocks uh, it uh, tells the storage container manager that you can safely delete these data blocks and then the storage container manager it finds out uh, where those container IDs and block IDs reside on the data node and uh, you know it can be deleted from there. Now how it changes with the snapshots? Very simple. So all the snapshots I talked about we maintain in a chain. So this is the uh, state of the chain, right? The snap 5 is the last snapshot in this chain and after that you have active object store. So let's say in the active object stores deleted table if i look at it uh, it says that i have to i have to reclaim whatever is in key 2 but then my algorithm will change slightly it will see whether the key 2 is, is still referenced by the previous snapshot and i don't have to walk a long snapshot here. it's good enough that i look at just immediately previous snapshot so i can't reclaim it but if i look at another key i can reclaim it so when we, when will i reclaim this key 2 this key 2 will be reclaimed when I delete this snapshot or any other snapshot uh, that is predecessor to it and it doesn't reference it. Similarly, snapshot deletion is a very easy workflow. It uh, operates on the same principle. So if I look, look at the deleted table of this snapshot 2 that is about to be deleted, I have key 4, key 5 and key 6 that I should be able to reclaim. But hold on, this key 4 and key 5 is referenced by snapshot 1. So I can't reclaim it. But key 6, I can reclaim it. It's not referenced. So what will I do with these keys that I cannot reclaim it? I will merge them in the deleted table of the snapshot 3. And once I have done that, I can just remove snapshot 2 completely from my snapshot 3. It gets simplified. And whatever I cannot reclaim will be reclaimed when I uh, delete a snapshot 3. So, that's the overall idea of a snapshot. We talked about a feature that can compute is efficient snap day between two snapshots. So I will invite Hemant to talk about that. Hey, everyone. So a uh, traditional way or like a generic way to uh, generate a depth between two snapshots would be uh, you go over the key space from snapshot one and snapshot two, and then uh, you go over the key name space and then generate the depth whether the key was created in previous snapshot or the like a source snapshot of the destination snapshot and based on that you, you create or delete or modify all the uh, renaming things but in RocksDB sorry so in, uh, in RocksDB uh, sorry in Ozone we uh, we optimize, uh, we leverage the uh, LSM architecture what does it mean is that uh, because RocksDB uses uh, LSM as a primary data structure to store the data uh, Sorry, uh, uses uh, as a data structure. So, yeah, uh, this, uh, yeah. So whatever the new uh, new changes go in the in the rocks DB, they get into the new SSD file. So let me uh, explain it with an example. So when we get a write request, the write request goes into the mem table and also get persisted persisted into the logs, you know, the wall logs. Over the time, your mem table. Uh, uh, get filled, and you what you do is you switch it to the immutable. Uh, you allocate another mem table, and subsequent requests will go to the new mem table. And <coughs> once you have this filled immutable mem table, you flush it to the SSD or to, to the disk. Okay, so uh, this is how the new update goes into the new SSD file. But how do we use this? in the calculation. So over the time you get more requests and you uh, we create like another SSD which is this, which is 004 and uh, this is like a common workflow for LSM based uh, databases. 
So now, just compare the SST files. What does it mean? Uh, let's say we have a state of uh, like our uh, database like this. We have SST file one and SST file two. You take a snapshot at this stage. Okay, now what happens? Over the time you get new, new changes and you get uh, another file three and four. And these are the new files basically, which are created after the snapshot one is taken. Now you take another snapshot at this state, which is a snapshot two, and which contains file one, file two, file three, file four. So what is the diff between a snapshot one and two? So the diff between a snapshot one and two would be the new files created after the snapshot one, basically. And you, you can see that SSD file three and SSD file four would be used to generate the diff. Uh, we are gonna go into the detail later. Uh, I'll just, uh, I was just showing you how this done. Yeah, that's another point. So what about the rocks to be compaction? So uh, uh, in LSM based uh, databases, uh, what happens is there are two ways to generate uh, SSD files. One is when you flush a MM table, or second is when you do a compaction. So uh, what we do is we track the compaction as well. We can solve this problem. So first let's uh, look at how the timeline works over the snapshot or the how SSD file gets evolved. So we have this active object store, which has uh, these file, SSD files. We, uh, we take a snapshot one, and over the time, uh, you have new changes or blocks to be compaction or something, whatever, and then you, your state changes from the previous state to this state, and you can see uh, file 22 and 24 are from the update, and file uh, 17 and 19, 21 are from the compaction from the previous level. New level. Now you take another snapshot, and same change, same thing happen. You have like a rocks to be compaction or mem table flash, and you reach to this new state where you have file 27, 28, 29, 24, 32, where 32 is basically basically new update. 24, uh, 27, 28, 29 is from the compaction, and 24 is we, they, there was no change in the file basically for any reason. The rocks we didn't compacted or like a, no changes were made to the, like it didn't have enough uh, changes, basically. So this, we talked about how the state changes over the time. Now let's say, take a closer look on the workflow. So when we get a uh, request for a snap diff, we, it goes to the snap diff handler. There we go to this pre-computed snap diff calculate, uh, check point. There we check whether snap diff is already calculated or not. So, as mentioned by Prashant, uh, or maybe not, uh, we store the snap diff for a certain time and then uh, reuse it for the same kind of a request. So if the snap diff is calculated, we uh, we do a, a fail fast kind of a thing and we return it from there. Otherwise, we do uh, we go to this uh, snap diff for SST file calculator and get the SST file change in between and get those files. Uh, we get it from the in-memory compaction DAG, which we maintain. We are gonna talk about it in the next slide. And once we get those SSD files, we discard the SSD files which don't belong to a bucket. Because bucket uh, snapshot is taken at the uh, bucket level, and uh, because checkpoint is taken at the rocks to be instance level, so we have to discard some files which don't belong, and then we go over the key set. Once we discard the fi uh, file which are not relevant, we go over the key name is space, and then we read those files using RocksDB APIs, and then uh, check whether that key is present in the first snapshot or, or second snapshot, and based on that we get whether the key was created, deleted, renamed, or modified. For rename handling, we use uh, object ID, which we maintain in the snap, uh, at ozone level, basically. So that's like a general flow about it. And we also persist this compaction DAG for restoring purpose if you have system crashes or something happens to it. Okay, so now we talked about the compaction and the uh, how we use in the uh, snap diff calculation. So let's look at look at this. Uh, let's say first uh, we have these files which were created by the RocksDB mem table flush. Okay, now over the time we have some changes. Sorry. Oh, uh, just two minutes. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we, we like we talked about the compaction. So let's say new compaction, uh, like a, this is the next level. 
uh, file on the right side are from the mem table flush and file on the right side are from the compaction. So we build this kind of a DAG in memory, uh, in memory also is sto stored and generated uh, like this, okay? So this, uh, this we built over the time. And let's say now we have this compaction DAG. So how do we use it in the snap day calculation? So let's assume we took a snapshot one at this level which contains 5, 15, 13, 11, 9, and we took another snapshot at this level. To compute a TIFF, you need to know, uh, what you need to do is the file which got created in between. So what we do is we do a back traversal for a snapshot, a snapshot to level two, a snapshot one. And whatever the leaf node we have are basically the new files or the changes file, which are needed to generate the snap TIFF. Okay, so, these are the files which are needed for the SNAP depth generation and we also